All right, uh, so let's get started for today's seminar. Um, and I'll welcome our first speaker for today, who is Max Gronke. Uh, Max did his PhD at Oslo University. And from there, he moved to a postdoc at UCSD. Um, he got a Hubble Fellowship, which he's done partially at UCSD and now uh, at Johns Hopkins University. And he'll be moving on to MPA uh, Garchin this fall. Uh, so we're really lucky to have him with us today to talk to us about cosmological simulations and specifically uh, cold gas in these simulations. So uh, a reminder to the audience that the meeting is recorded. Um, and yeah, without further ado, uh, Max, please take it away. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Marianne. So that was um, U UCSB, sorry, just for, uh, oh for gosh, correctness. So sorry. That's, that's completely fine. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to, for the record, it's, uh, in Santa Barbara. Uh, anyways, all right, so thanks uh, again for the intro. And yeah, thank you for inviting, or Anna, for inviting me. Um, and yeah, it's a shame this didn't work out last uh, spring. I would have really liked to come up to Boston, but um, but here we are in a Zoom room. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about uh, yeah convergence in cosmological simulations, specifically cold gas convergence, and specifically I jump right in in the circumgalactic medium. I I know many of you know about the circumgalactic medium, but uh, just for those who, who might not know so much, um, you know why should we care about the circumgalactic medium? Um, and I like to often bring two points. Uh, the first one being that we know when, when structures form, um, you know, gas was streaming into these, these dark matter potentials and in the process converting um, gravitational energy to kinetic one, which was then thermalized through shocks forming these hot gas halos. And, you know, they're still around the more massive galaxies. So, you know, the circumgalactic medium in a way existed before the straddler structures because some of this gas later on just cooled and formed all the stars, planets, everything we we usually study. Um, and then secondly, you know, the the circumgalactic medium, everything that gets fed to a galaxy or recycled from galaxy has to pass through the circumgalactic medium. So I think you know it's an excellent uh, test bed for probe of feedback mechanisms and you know for testing the gas supply for for future star formation. So in general, I would say. The CGM is, is an ideal test bed for our model of galaxy formation and evolution. And now we have a lot of data coming in into uh, about the CGM. So it's, it's actually quite an active field, I would say. Um, now, well, a lot of the data that is coming in is, is absorption line studies um, where a bright background source, often a quasar, is used. And you, know, you, can, you can then detect a bunch of lines. And for instance, what is very commonly detected is uh, neutral hydrogen, uh, showing us that inside these hot halos that form, there's actually quite a lot of cold gas. And, and cold throughout this talk, I, I mean 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas, hot uh, 10 to the 6 or hotter, usually the, you know, the virial temperature of these, these halos. And um, <clears throat> these, these observations, they can go further than just detect this amount of cold gas, but we can, we can use them to study uh, the structure of this cold gas. And um, because you, you detect um, several lines, you can do some photoionization modeling, which does not only give you, you know, the column densities, but also the number densities of this cold gas. And you know, there's really a lot of studies on this. And they usually find that dividing these two, these two numbers, you get the upper limit on the length scale of this cold gas, which is of you know, order of 100 parsec or so. You can, you know, do also study the circumgalactic medium in the mission, and that's been done around um, quasars. And there are people, um, you know, estimated some clumping factors necessary in order to explain the surface brightness profiles observed. And they also found, you know, cold gas uh, structures smaller than forty parsec or so. Um, similarly, kinematic information. You know, if you have these these very high resolution absorption line systems such as here, you know, you can, you can say, okay, how many Gaussians do I need in order to fit such a, such a spectrum? And the number of these, these systems 
as a function of equivalent width is plotted here in Churchill et al. Also suggesting, you know, you have several discrete uh, cold gas structures inside this circumelectic medium. So overall, you know, the picture I want you to have in mind is that, you know, we have a quite abundant cold gas. So, you know, everywhere uh, observers look, they, they find cold gas in the circumgalactic medium, which means that you have an aerial covering factor, which is quite large of order unity. But, uh, you know, because these, these clumplets are so small, the volume filling fraction is actually quite, quite small. And, you know, just looking at these, these length scales here, uh, being in the circumgalactic medium, which is hundreds of kiloparsecs across, you know, you already see that this is quite challenging for cosmological simulations. And that's, you know, been, been known for, for a while. Um, you know, this is a study by Claude André Fauché Guerre, uh, where, you know, he just increased the resolution of his simulation. And that's exactly the same, you know, neutral, cold, uh, neutral hydrogen column density. So again, the cold gas, and you can just see visually, you know, there's, there's not, not, not convergence here. Um, recently, what has been done is that, you know, instead of increasing the overall resolution of your whole simulation, um, people have just increased the resolution inside a certain volume around the galaxy inside the CGM. So here, that's a study by Cameron Hummels, where he just increased um, the, the resolution around this galaxy to a uniform grade of 500 parsec. And, you know, again, the color coding corresponds to the neutral hydrogen column density. And again, you see, you know, there's clearly not a convergent um, uh, properties here. And as I said, that's a quite active field. There's, there's a few other studies I should mention, for instance, Freke van der Voort, who was, I think, the first one publishing such an enhanced uh, CGM resolution study. And, you know, I, one, one question which, you know, I want to address in this talk is, you know, what resolution do we need in order to obtain convergence on this cold gas mass here? And um, I know that's a first order question is just looking at the cold gas mass, you know, there's more complicated observables such as O6 or, or other things like the structure. Um, but I still think this first order question is important because such simulations are oftentimes used to study, for instance, the ionizing photon escape or, you know, the fuel for future star formation, galactic winds, all these things that clearly do depend on, you know, the, the total cold gas mass to first order. So I think um, you know, studying uh, such convergence or, or demanding that we have convergence in this property is not really uh, outrageous. I should also mention that, you know, these convergence studies are, are important and, and very good, but it, it's often in these numerical study convergence tests are just not enough. And the reason for this is that you can, you know, you can increase your spatial resolution per dimension, say, by a factor of eight or so if you really stretch it. But uh, there is this plateau of false convergence, I'm sure many of you heard about. And so you're never really sure if you have converged, if you don't know what length scale you actually do want to resolve. So I think, um, you know, in this talk, what I really want to do is to zoom in in, in some of these uh, circumgalactic medium uh, called gas clouds and, you know, explore what kind of length scales do we have and what would lead to convergence in this total cold gas mass. Um, yeah, so if we were to zoom in, you know, here in, in one of these cold gas clouds, what we would see, I sketched this before, is a, it's a cloud of 10 to the 4 Kelvin surrounded by this hot medium of 10 to the 6 Kelvin or hotter, and you have this mixed material in this thin layer between hot and gold gas. And, you know, if you were to zoom even further in, we would see that, you know, the, the length scale governing this mixed material is the field length, that's where you know, thermal conduction is balanced by cooling. Um, so it's, you know, the, the um, yeah, the square root of the thermal conduction coefficient uh, and, and the, the cooling time. And, um, you know, the standard wisdom was that, you know, we do need to, to converge, uh, sorry, resolve the field length in order to get the mass transfer rate between the hot and the cold medium correct. And therefore the total cold gas mass. And you know the the work I will be mainly talking about was led by Brent Tan, who was a very um, or is a very uh, talented grad student at UCSB, and he ran you know in detail simulations of of such a mixing layer. And here you see his 1D result, and 
that's exactly as, as predicted, right? That once we do resolve this field length here, you see that if you include conduction, this blue line converges to the correct solution, to the analytic solution shown in, shown in red here. So indeed, you know, if you resolve, once you resolve the field length, you do converge and you converge to correct solutions. However, if you do not include conduction, you know, that's the orange line here, you see that you will, you will never converge, you will never get a, a converged mass transfer rate between hot and cold medium and therefore never uh, converge total cold gas mass. And I should also mention there has been recently, you know, several other studies uh, by Drum Fielding, by Su Chang Ching, uh, who, who, who also studied this turbulent mixing layer, but I will focus on our work here. Now, the interesting thing is if you go to 3D, you know, it seems that, you know, even without conduction, so that would be the, the yellow line here or orange line in, in 1D here, there seems to be convergence in this total cold gas mass rate. Right? And you can see that here where the colored lines are different uh, resolution and that's the cooling rate. So that's just proportional to your uh, mass transfer rate as a function of time. Now, the question is, you know, is that really converged or is that one of these plateaus of false convergence? And uh, that's very important because, you know, usually you, you don't resolve the field length in these larger 3D studies or, or conduction is not, not even included. So the question is, you know, do we need to resolve this field length or, or not? And um, the, the problem is, is really visualized here, um, maybe even better, because you see these are two slices through Grant's simulation box. First, the, the temperature, and that's, that's the cooling emission. And so the cooling emission is where, where this cooling or the mass transfer is happening. And you see that it's, it's very thin. It's this, in fact, this one cell thick emission layer here. Um, and, you know, that, that's, it's still one cell thick, even if you increase or decrease the resolution. And you do understand why now this is one cell thick, right? Because this is without conduction. So you don't resolve the field length. And so the emissivity here is unconverged. Now, the strange thing is I just told you that the, the mass, the total uh, mass transfer rate seems to be converged. So it's somewhat of a puzzle because, you know, that means that the, the volume needs to adapt in such a way exactly so that the left-hand side here is converged, but the right-hand side here is not. So what's really going on here? And in fact, you know, there's a few more puzzles because if you, if you write down the scaling of this mass transfer rate, uh, Brand found that, you know, first of all, to first order, it's given by the cold gas sound speed. And that's maybe a bit puzzling because, you know, if you think about this mass transfer rate here, the hot gas can sustain a much larger mass transfer rate to first order given by the hot gas sound speed. And secondly, you know, the, there is this dependence on the cooling time with a certain uh, power law. And what Brand found there is actually this transition between, you know, uh, one half and one quarter power law as a function of cooling strength. Um, so the question is, why do we have these two regimes and why does it exactly change from, you know, one half power law to, to one quarter? And if you actually look at, uh, you know, two of these simulations, one in this, this slow cooling regime, one in the, the fast cooling regime, you also visually see that these, these two regimes are actually quite different. They're not just different in scaling, also visually they're quite different. So here I, you know, step through the simulation box and I show you some slices of temperature and, and emissivity. And, uh, you know, you see that in the left in this weak cooling regime, the, there's much more mixed material of 10 to the 5 Kelvin or so, where in the, the strong cooling regime, the morphology is clearly quite different. And you have a much, um, much more multi-phase uh, structure. Now, with all these puzzles, um, we, you know, to, to understand them theoretically, we luckily got help from, uh, for us, a somewhat unexpected direction. And that's, you know, the field of turbulent combustion. Because, you know, in that field, what they do is they mix, instead of mixing hot and cold medium and then cooling it, um, what they do is they mix fuel and oxidizer and then they burn it. But very different to, to us, to, to astrophysics, we, they, they have a lot of funding because, you know, turbulent combustions, you, if you want to build, and jet engine or a car engine or 
you know, bombs, you, you, you do want to study it. And, and there's actually a lot of results uh, in the literature, which we could be inspired from. And, you know, I, I don't have time to really go into a lot of details here, or probably it's also not a seminar to go into too much technical details, but uh, I just want to mention this one classic paper by Gerhard Damkühler from 1940. Um, Gerhard Damkühler was actually a tragic character in, in Germany at the time he, he, he published this, this paper where he not only you know, did experiments, he, he studied the burning of Bun Bunsen, at Bunsen burners at different burning rates, and he studied the flame exactly. And, um, but so, so the great thing here is also that he did experiments and in this field you can do experiments, which mean you know, that's a great way to, to do resolution studies, so to speak. Um, but uh, yeah, and then, then he, Gerhard Dankula was actually forced by the Nazis to work on the Luftwaffe program. And uh, in, instead of doing that, he, he committed suicide. So that was really his last, uh, last paper. And it's a, it's, um, it's a great one. It's really classic in the field. He, in this paper, you know, he not only actually did experiments, but he also did a lot of theory and uh, tried to really understand what, what it sets this burning rate between, um, between fuel, uh, for, sets the burning rate, yeah. And he found that, you know, the important thing is actually not the laminar flame speed, so not, you know, what sets an individual front, but the overall front, and that's the, the turbulent frame speed. And he also noticed that in his Bunsen burn experiments, and you can maybe even see that here, this is, you know, this is a image of a turbulent flame and just visually it looks very similar to, you know, what I just showed you of these cooling fronts, right? And he, he saw that, you know, there's actually these two dis different distinct regimes, one where he called well stirred, where the flame front is more or less straight and one where the, the flame front is, is corrugated. So um, he called that wrinkled flame front regimes. And later on, he, he realized that these two regimes are uh, divided by this dimensional quantity, which is given by the turbulent time divided by the reaction time. And later on, people actually now call this the Damkohler number. Um, now, yeah, again, if you, if you think about these two slices I just showed you before, this is really what's, what's happening here. Here, we have a well-stirred um, mixing front and here, it's really much more corrugated. There's this wrinkled flame front. So in this regime, we are in the dump color number smaller than unity. And in this regime, we're in the dump color number larger than unity. In our setup, you know, the, the, um, the reaction time is nothing else than the cooling time. And the turbulent time is given just usually by the length scale divided by your turbulent velocity. So if you compute this dump color number of this mixed medium, you know, as, as a, you know, as a function of cooling strengths, you see that in fact this transition happens really roughly at this uh, dump curler number of order unity. So, so you know, that's that's really great to help understand what's going on even in this in this cooling cooling fronts. Now you can go much much further than that, and I'm sorry if that's a bit technical, but uh, you know now we know that the mass transfer rate is actually given by this turbulent uh, flame speed. And you can you can rewrite that as some with some turbulent uh, diffusion coefficient, which turns out that then it's you know proportional to the reaction time to the minus one half. Now in the well stirred regime, the you know everything is stirred, so the gas can just cool freely. So the reaction time is just the cooling time. So you automatically obtain this minus uh, one half dependence here. Um, in the corrugated flame regime, it's a bit more complicated because you can see the flame clearly cannot cool freely. There's some uh, new length scale, and you know what we what we said here is that you know there is actually what's called, what we call the turbulent field length is where this turbulent diffusion uh, is balanced by cooling. So just very similar to your classical classical field length. And if you plug plug this in, you in fact find this minus uh, one quarter um, also found in the simulation. So uh, that's, that's really where, where this comes from. And maybe that was too, too technical, but just one thing maybe you want to uh, take away here is that here, that's exactly the definition again of your dump number. And if you go in the literature of 
of these um, burning fronts, there is actually experimental data also seeing this dump kernel number to the one quarter dependence, which was quite encouraging for us. Um, so, you know, what does that all mean for these initial questions? You know, I told you about the transition regimes and scalings. Um, now, why, you know, is the mass transfer rate given to first order by the cold gas sound speed and not the, the hot gas sound speed? And that is, you know, if you, you know, the first order is given by this turbulent velocity. And so if you plug in, you know, say the length scale divided by the Kelvin Helmholtz time, you really see that the cold gas sound speed is coming out. And I will, you know, I will elaborate on this in, in just a second because it's very related to the first question. And that is, why do we have convergence, you know, even if we don't resolve these individual flame fronts? So to, to answer this question, let's just recall that, um, that we, what, what this dump cooler number greater than unity regime really means. It means that, you know, all gas that you mix cools, the cooling time scale is the fastest time scale of the system. And, um, so the question here really is what sets the mixing? And if you think about this famous um, poem by Lewis Richardson, um, big worlds have little worlds which feed on their velocity and little worlds have lesser worlds and so on to viscosity. This is, this is really what's going on here. We have some big worlds we can mix into little worlds and, and so on. And if you want to write down the properties of these worlds, you know, the turnover time of such a world, it's just the length scale by your turbulent velocity. And the energy of the world is the kinetic energy, so length scale times velocity squared. And we know from Golmogorov that this is proportional to five third. So you can write down, you know, what is this this turnover time? And you see that you know the the turnover time of these big worlds is larger than the turnover time of these smaller smaller worlds. And that seems trivial, but what this means physically is that you know whatever your big world can mix, your your little worlds can deal with. Or, you know, in other words, if you can resolve these, these big eddies, it doesn't matter where you cut uh, your, your turbulent cascade. Um, that's, that's not really important. What sets the mixing rate is really these big, big eddies. And, you know, you all know that from when you mix cream into your coffee, because you know what, what is important there is, you know, the motion of the spoon and not this, the small scale molecular diffusion between cream and coffee. To, to set the overall mixing rate. Um, so, you know, to, to come back to this initial question, that, that means that the, the resolving the field length 3D is not required in order to um, get the mass transfer rate between hot and cold medium correctly. And Brand showed this here uh, just as a test. That's the um, cooling rate as a function of time, you know, without um, conduction and, and with conduction with some different conduction coefficients. And you see that, you know, overall um, this, this mass transfer rate seems to be the same. And that's really because this turbulent diffusion is much larger than your, your conduction. All right, so I hope I convinced you, you know, that it's not the field length we do need to resolve in order to get our big cosmological simulations correctly. But if it's not the field length, you know, that's a, that's a very standard candidate, what, what is it? And um, I realized I took much longer than I thought I would in this first part of the talk. So um, I just gonna give you, you know, two candidates for, for the clump sizes or for what, what we would need to resolve. Because what is important I said is the outer scale and that would be this, this clump size of this cold gas. And, you know, one argument I often hear is, well, you know, we shouldn't care about these small clumps because I only care about, say, mass inflow rates of, I don't know, above a thousand solar masses per year or something. But I just want to remind you that, you know, these small clumps, they might grow and they might come, become later dynamically important. But of course, if you don't resolve them initially, you, you won't have this growth in, in your system. So I, I would argue that, you know, resolving this, this relevant clump size is important. And you know, these two candidates I want to present quickly are the shattering scale and uh, what I call survival length. So the shattering scale uh, was proposed by uh, Mike McCourt. 
and he was inspired by thermal instability. He thought about, you know, what happens if a big gas cloud, and big meaning that the sound crossing time is much larger than the cooling time, is cooling. So the conventional wisdom was that, you know, it's cooling quickly on the time scale of the cooling time. And then, because the sound crossing time is so long, it slowly contracts until it's back in pressure, pressure equilibrium. And from here to here, it would be wildly out of pressure equilibrium. But we know and, and might know, knew that you know, nature doesn't like to be out of pressure equilibrium. So instead, he proposed that it's, it's fragmenting into small pieces in this process. And you know, the pieces would be the minimum of the CST cool, which is of order of 0.1 parsec at a medium of one atom per cubic centimeter. And the beautiful thing about this idea is that it really naturally, in a way, explains these large aerial covering fractions and low volume filling fractions, um, you know, observed in the circumgalactic media. So here are some two simulations: cooling down, that's density projections, one from uh, where the cloud is of order of C minimum CST cool, and one where it's really much larger. And you know, you see that indeed this cloud is fragmenting, and this is just slowly contracting. Um, well, I, I guess I'm out of time. Mariam, am I? Uh, yes, essentially. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, it doesn't matter. I, I have a second length scale, which, um, which is uh, what I call survival length. And that, you know, if, if a cloud is larger than that, it would survive a ram pressure acceleration process. But um, because I'm out of time, I'm going to skip. Wow. Okay. I'm, I'm I actually completely mistimed this, I realized. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I just jumped to the end. And uh, because I, I don't want to be rude and go to my second, over my second, uh, the second speaker's time. So, you know, I didn't have time to really talk about this part of the talk, but I talked a lot about this part. So I hope at least I could convince you all that we don't need to resolve the field length and, and why this is. And, you know, if, if you, you want to discuss about these other length scales or in general about multi-phase gases, it's a shame I can't visit. Um, and I don't think I'll be able to visit before I'm out of this country. But if you ever are in the Munich area, would love to discuss it over in the beer garden or on a blackboard or something. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank, uh, thanks, Max. Sorry. Hey, hey, Anna. <laughs> I apologize. I was a few minutes late. <laughs> I'm also on California time and I slept through my 7 a.m. alarm. I thought I hit snooze, no but I guess I no didn't. Problem. I've been able to do 6 a.m. mornings when needed and I apologize. Right. There was so a time personal. Yeah, there was a change of hour this weekend. Makes my oh, you, oh God, you're totally right. And normally I learn about that in social situations and those don't happen now. Um, yeah, great. Thank you for that great talk. I'm going to be in charge of um, uh, helping guiding the questions. So if you have a question, um, please raise your hand and the um, uh, please raise your hand in the uh, chat. And um, and I I will start actually. I'm going to ask the typical question. I'm sure you get all the time. Uh, what about magnetic fields? Like so, you'll expect that 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 will. So you get this turbulent mixing. Um, which is really important. Um, but once you have magnetic fields, uh, you have, uh, you'll definitely suppress uh, um, thermal conduction, but with the mixing that you have, uh, you, can, you can lose, you can have smaller like turbulent mixing, which is probably what you're seeing here. So have you thought about that? Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, so that's, that's a good point. So in general, you know, magnetic fields are often work to, to, Yes, say basically that you you know your your usual thermal conduction is is highly suppressed, right? And uh, but yeah, you're right for this for this turbulent mixing I'm I was discussing here. This this has a, a lower effect. However, you know as we all know, these these high dynamic instabilities that lead to the mixing, mainly the Kelvin Helmholtz, are also suppressed uh, yeah. through magnetic fields. Uh, so you know we would expect a lower mass transfer rate there. Now, interestingly, in larger simulations where I tested this, this doesn't seem to be the, the case. I, well, I actually have a slide on that, but um, I don't know if I find it really quick. Uh, and, um, you know, so far it's not been studied in great detail and it's a puzzle why this is. Um, it's somewhat suppressed. It's not maybe as suppressed as much. And our idea is that, you know, what 
what happens instead is that you increase the surface area of this cold gas and therefore you know your m dot which is proportional both to your you know inflow velocity which would be suppressed through magnetic fields but also proportional to your surface area of the cold gas mass is less affected than you would think Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this on a smaller scale. And we've seen this in simulations of like with star cluster wind feedback and so on, highly dominated by these uh, turbulent motions. Great. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? If so, please raise your hand. Okay, um, I think we're about time for the next speaker. So I'll let Marion introduce the next speaker. But thanks again. Let's all thanks. Thanks, Max, again, for this great talk. Thank you. Um, all right, so Kira, if you can go ahead and share your slides. Yep. All right, uh, can you see that? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Great. So uh, Kira is actually, um, you know, returning in some sense to CFA. He was a graduate student here. And, uh, and since then, he's been in Chicago, where he holds an NSF fellowship at UChicago and a Tram fellowship at Fermilab. And uh, so he's an expert in CMB science. Today, we'll hear a little bit more about his work on uh, Kira, uh, take it away. Awesome. Uh, thanks very much, Marion. Uh, yeah, it's always a, always a pleasure to be back at, at the CFA and, and, and working with uh, old, old friends and colleagues, even if it is just virtual. Uh, so today I am going to uh, talk about some work we've been doing in Chicagoland uh, to develop a new instrumentation uh, for uh, next generation cosmological surveys in the millimeter wave range. Uh, so uh, let me give you, uh, you know, we'll start with the big picture. So when we want to learn about cosmology, uh, we want to learn, the base, learn about the basic lambda CDM model, uh, measure cosmological parameters to extremely high precision, or perhaps quantify uh, extensions to lambda CDM that might require new physics. Uh, we're motivated to measure as much of the structure of the universe as possible, right? So on the left uh, is the basic schematic uh, showing int interesting phases in the universe history. Uh, Redshift 1100, uh, the CMB, uh, the Dark Ages, eventual emergence of first stars and galaxies, uh, reionization, and finally, uh, the growth of structure and the peak of cosmic star formation leading up to the present. And so you can ask, uh, what are the probes that we use to get a better sense of uh, the large scale structure in these epochs? Uh, so for one thing, of course, we can measure the CMB, uh, look at the initial conditions, small over and under densities, uh, and in a much lower redshift, uh, close to home, we can conduct galaxy surveys, right? We can use the locations of galaxies uh, as tracers uh, of the underlying density field uh, to probe basic cosmology. Uh, but when you look at the, uh, the redshift range that's accessible by galaxy surveys, uh, you'll notice that most, uh, most large scale structure, uh, uh, sorry, most large volume surveys don't really extend far beyond redshift of two to three or so, right? This is simply because galaxies get further away uh, they become fainter and they're harder to pick out against some noise threshold. And so, you know, even though you can use facilities like Hubble and Alma to pick out individual galaxies, maybe out to Redshift 10 or JWST, uh, even, even further, uh, those are very targeted observations that only detect uh, individual bright sources. And so with those measurements, you're never going to get enough objects to really probe the large scale density field at high redshift. So we have this uh, very significant redshift gap uh, in between galaxy surveys uh, and the CMB, uh, for which we don't have uh, uh, really sensitive measurements of large scale structure. I believe that uh, intensity mapping uh, is a new technique uh, that is a really promising new observable to probe this region. Uh, so the idea of intensity mapping is that uh, instead of trying to pick out individual galaxies, you use uh, low angular resolution observations to integrate over those individual, uh, individual emitting objects. And so uh, since most of the cosmological information we're interested in is at fairly large scales, uh, you don't need a, a big dish. And so this uh, ends up being uh, significantly more efficient uh, than the galaxy surveys, and I'll get into that. And so uh, many people have already seen an example of this. Uh, one is uh, the cosmic infrared background, uh, the CIB. Uh, this is the integrated emission of many uh, high redshift dusty galaxies. And so uh, when you observe the CIB, 
uh, you see a 2D screen that's composed of uh, many smooth dust spectra at, at many distances. Uh, and so it's uh, a problem with this is that uh, it's quite difficult to determine the distance to sources, of course, unless you resolve them. But uh, we want as much information as possible. So uh, what if we want the 3D information? What can we do then? Uh, we know that those, those galaxies uh, are also emitting spectral lines, right? And so this immediately leads us to an extension of intensity mapping, uh, which we call line intensity mapping. Uh, and so here, you choose a particular uh, spectral line to target, uh, so you know it's uh, rest frame wavelength, uh, and you observe it using a spectrometer. And so, of course, instead of a, a 2D projected map, uh, you now have a wavelength uh, direction in your data cube that corresponds to redshift and therefore distance. Uh, and so here's a, a simple illustration. On, on the top, we have a, uh, a simulation of a 3D galaxy distribution. And, uh, and on the bottom uh, is uh, an example of the uh, low resolution intensity map that you might observe. So uh, a bright spot in the intensity map just means that there's more line emission, meaning uh, more galaxies emitting in that line. And, and that generally means that the underlying density field is stronger there. So on the left is a, uh, is a 2D uh, spatial slice. Uh, and, and on the right are uh, slices in frequency, each corresponding to a uh, particular redshift for this line. So, okay, so what I've described is a, it's an observable that's basically a low angular resolution spectroscopic galaxy survey. So why in the world uh, would, would you want to do this? Well, uh, the, one of the main differences uh, in between intensity mapping and, uh, and galaxy surveys is how the signal is detected. Right, so in a galaxy survey, you have a noise threshold uh, and you look for sources that are a certain number of sigma above it. But if there are sources below that noise threshold, right, they're not detected, even though those photons still exist in your map. Uh, so an intensity map, on the other hand, uh, does not waste those photons from the faint sources, right? So as long as you characterize uh, the noise properties uh, correctly, uh, there's still useful information in, in every map pixel. Uh, and so this, this property isn't all that useful low redshift where a traditional galaxy survey can indeed detect every galaxy. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, at redshifts above two to three or so, uh, it becomes much harder to detect uh, enough objects to, uh, to probe large scale structures. So this regime, uh, the low signal to noise regime is where I think intensity mapping is going to be extremely useful, extending these large scale structure measurements out to very high redshift. Okay, so uh, why do you care about that high redshift structure in the first place? Uh, first of all, your precision on cosmological parameters uh, scales with the survey volume, uh, or, or really mode count, which is uh, the number of independent pieces of information in your map. And so uh, in the plot on the left, you can see the potential gain. I'm showing uh, the volume of the light cone out to some maximum redshift. Uh, and on the right, uh, you can see a measure of the mode count out to that redshift. And so you can see uh, immediately that by pushing from uh, redshift two or three to five or six, or potentially even higher, uh, you can get an order of magnitude uh, increase in, in mode count. Uh, in addition to uh, just measuring cosmological parameters more precisely, uh, pushing back these measurements uh, will allow us to probe the universe in a totally different epoch, uh, when the dominant constituent of the universe was matter, not dark energy. Uh, and so this allows uh, a number of parameter degeneracies to be broken. Uh, and of course, uh, there's a ton of astrophysics happening at high redshift that we're just starting to get a handle on now, like understanding large-scale morphology of the epic reionization. Uh, and so it's, it's also worth noting that uh, intensity maps will often overlap with galaxy surveys, so they can be cross-correlated. They can provide higher precision on the structure that's measured in common. Uh, and uh, because the observation techniques are very different, the observational systematics will be as well, and that always helps. So I'm going to briefly mention two cosmology science cases that I'm interested in uh, as, as, uh, for the future. Uh, so the first would be uh, to measure the expansion history of the universe in the matter-dominated era. Uh, so as many people uh, in this audience well know, uh, we can use the baryon acoustic oscillation uh, standard ruler, right? It's the observed length scale of oscillations in the matter power spectrum uh, to, to map out the Hubble parameter and the angular diameter distance as a function of redshift. And so, uh, on the left, in black, I'm plotting the standard lambda CDM expansion history as function of redshift uh, with uh, real measurements in gray and some forecasts for potential future intensity mapping experiments as, as the colored error bars. Uh, and uh, illustrating a similar point, uh, on, the, on the right, uh, this paper showed that uh, if you try to arbitrarily reconstruct 
uh, the expansion history using just current data, you get uh, curves that look like, uh, like the red, uh, which you can see are totally unconstrained above redshift two. Uh, whereas intensity mapping data uh, can constrain it uh, down to, uh, to the blue curves. Uh, so the motivation for high redshift uh, intensity mapping measurements here would be to test the litany of, uh, of dynamical and early dark energy models that are in the literature, uh, many of which were cooked up to, uh, to explain the current tension in the Hubble constant. And so uh, a number of these models predict up to several percent deviation from the lambda CDM expansion history at high redshift, uh, which as you can see on the left could be, uh, could be constrained by instruments that we can build in the next decade. Uh, an even more ambitious goal would be to go after primordial non-Gaussian non right? So in our, in our current cosmological paradigm, uh, the initial conditions of the universe were set by a process called inflation, uh, which is an exponential expansion in early times uh, that promoted quantum fluctuations to macroscopic scales. And so in the CMB, we've measured those fluctuations to be extremely Gaussian. Uh, but there are some inflationary models, uh, in particular multi-field inflation, uh, that often produce uh, a small amount of non-Gaussian as well. Uh, and so in addition to, uh, in addition to uh, things like the bispectrum, an interesting about not, thing about non-Gaussianity is that it produces a scale-dependent bias in the galaxy power spectrum uh, that's most evident in large scales. Uh, so you can see in this plot, there's an enhancement of power at very low K. Uh, so a number of projections, including those by uh, folks at CFA, including uh, uh, Cardo Keating, uh, indicate that a uh, correctly designed intensity mapping experiment could be as powerful uh, or possibly more powerful than, than experiments uh, such as SphereX uh, in constraining the scale dependent bias. Uh, and uh, this measurement is, of course, highly complementary to B mode measurements from experiments like uh, CMB experiments like BICEP and CMBS4. So uh, I, these are just two basic cosmology science cases. There are many, many more that, that exist, like uh, neutrinos or, uh, or reionization, which I won't talk about because uh, we're limited on time. Uh, OK, so uh, established that we want to measure uh, these high redshifts with, uh, with line intensity mapping. Uh, so the next thing is uh, we need to choose a line to target. So as, as uh, people at CFA well know, um, much of the community is working on uh, 21 centimeter uh, neutral hydrogen uh, intensity mapping, uh, which will be uh, especially useful for uh, tracing uh, the neutral intergalactic medium uh, during reionization and, and seeing large scale dynamics. Uh, I've been working on a different technique. Uh, I've been working on targeting lines that we can measure largely using uh, CMB heritage technology. And I think uh, this aspect is actually gonna be critical uh, because we're attempting to measure very faint low surface brightness extended emission with extremely low systematics. And this, this sort of measurement uh, hasn't yet been demonstrated uh, with, with uh, hydrogen intensity mapping, although we're hoping it will soon. So uh, uh, what lines are we targeting? So it turns out that galaxies uh, that trace the underlying dark matter distribution, right, especially uh, galaxies at high redshift, are often very rapidly forming stars. Uh, and therefore, uh, they're quite dusty. and uh, so, uh, so you have uh, young stars uh, uh, emitting that optical, uh, optical UV radiation, uh, and that light is absorbed by the dust, uh, which is then re-emitted in the far infrared. And so that's, uh, of course, the emission you see in, this, in the cosmic infrared background. Uh, and on top of that far IR radiation are atomic and molecular uh, emission lines that are excited, excited by that stellar light. Uh, so you can see in this, in this very rough schematic of the ISM, uh, there are lots of lines uh, in the ISM that, uh, that can be observed, nitrogen, carbon, CO, uh, all of which trace different phases. Uh, and so doing intensity mapping with these lines uh, is an idea that was first proposed maybe about uh, 10 years ago uh, by Avi and, and a few others, uh, and has gained a lot of traction since. Uh, so here we see some of those typical far AR emission lines in a galaxy spectrum. So uh, here we're plotting uh, flux versus rest frame wavelength uh, with the continuum dust emission removed. So I'll highlight a couple of interesting lines. Uh, the brightest one in general is the ionized carbon fine structure line known as C2 or C plus, uh, one of the dominant coolants in the ISM. Uh, and then uh, you can see uh, the carbon monoxide rotational ladder, right? So it, it emits in this, in this distinctive ladder of uh, J to J minus one transitions. Uh, and so even though it's uh, a fair bit uh, fainter, it's uh, quite easy to pick out. So if you place a galaxy uh, that looks like this uh, with the spectrum at high redshift, 
the whole thing gets shifted to longer wavelengths by a factor of one plus z. And suddenly, many of these lines are now observable uh, in the millimeter wave region instead of the far IR. Uh, and that means uh, you can observe them quite easily with ground-based telescopes. So let me illustrate that. Uh, here we're looking at uh, the atmospheric transmission uh, from the South Pole in blue. And the colored blocks uh, rough, roughly indicate the band passes that a typical CMB experiment would observe it. So one, two, and three millimeters are, uh, are typical. Uh, and now on top of this, we're plotting uh, some of the spectral lines that show, that show up in these windows. Uh, so each arc corresponds to a, uh, either a CO transition or a C2. Uh, and the color of each line uh, indicates the redshift from which it originated. So you can see that on the right. And so all of this modeling was done by, uh, by Cardo Keating. Uh, so there are a couple things to note here. Uh, first of all, uh, in each of the three atmospheric windows, uh, you'll notice that you're actually sensitive to a combination of lines that in principle spans basically the full redshift range of zero to nine or 10. Uh, and second, if you tried to observe uh, these lines uh, using a broadband detector, uh, like, like what you have in a CMB telescope, uh, you will not really be able to localize that line emission in redshift very well, right? It would be totally washed out. So instead, what we need to do is to add spectroscopy to access those fluctuations along the line of sight. Uh, so once again, uh, CMB facilities are already doing exactly what we want for intensity mapping. They're making extremely sensitive measurements of extended low surface brightness emission over thousands of square degrees with low systematics with arc minute resolution. So all we need to do is add spectroscopy to CMB detectors. So this is exactly uh, the problem I've been working to solve with the SuperSpec collaboration. Uh, this is everybody involved. Uh, it's primarily out of Caltech and Chicago. Now, normally when you think of a wideband spectrometer uh, in the millimeter range, you think of something like a diffraction grating or maybe a fabry perot uh, These are proven technologies and they actually work quite well. Uh, and, and the first generation of intensity mapping experiments in the millimeter, uh, such as TIME or CCAT Prime or Concerto are gonna be using them. Uh, but these devices are large and bulky and they're, they're generally hard to mass produce and to scale up. And the, the key issue is that space inside your telescope is at a premium. And we wanna pack as many detectors into a small volume as possible. So the super spec idea is that instead of using a grating, uh, we print the entire spectrometer on a silicon wafer. We're basically taking CMB detector technology and extending it to spectroscopy. Uh, and if you do this, you get massive space savings. So uh, on the left is uh, the time spectrometer. Uh, and so you can see its volume is about 700 cubic centimeters. And the equivalent super spec device is only one cubic centimeter. So for uh, a given instrument volume, uh, you can see we should be able to pack in orders of magnitude more, more detectors. And this is uh, very important because the first generation of instruments such as time are, uh, are likely only gonna be sensitive enough to detect the power spectrum itself, but not enough to do things like BAO or non-Gaussianity. So we really see this as the enabling technology to be doing uh, precision cosmology with intensity mapping. Uh, SuperSpec is a filter bank spectrometer. So uh, broadband radiation is sorted by a series of narrowband filters. So uh, on this, in this diagram here, I'm, I'm showing an input transmission line at the top, uh, which carries the broadband radiation that was collected by your telescope. Uh, it then encounters a series of resonant filters, each of which uh, picks off a different uh, frequency. So each is, is tuned to a different lambda over two. Uh, and that frequency is uh, then sent to a detector. And so you can see simulations of uh, filter responses uh, at a couple of different points in our two to three inch gigahertz band. Uh, and so our baseline design has resolving power uh, R of about 300. So that gives you about one gigahertz resolution at 300 gigahertz. And on the bottom is what the chip looks like in practice. So radiation is collected uh, by a lens, uh, sent down this uh, center feed line, and each of those rectangles is a different uh, filter and, uh, and kinetic inductance detector. So we have been uh, fabricating these devices for a few years now. Uh, and now they're, they're ready to demonstrate on the sky. So you can read about it in, in this paper where I reviewed the full system performance. Uh, the main points are first that the filter bank itself works. Uh, so each in this plot, uh, each uh, differently colored uh, line, uh, so each differently colored uh, uh, patch is the spectrum of a different detector. And so you can say they're, see they're each centered at a different millimeter wave frequency. And for context in this, in this frequency range, uh, uh, which would normally be covered by, by a single CMB detector, uh, we have 40 spectral channels. 
And uh, the noise performance is, uh, is good enough for ground-based observations, although we still need to improve them a bit if we want to send them to space. So the next step is to demonstrate that these detectors can actually do science. Uh, so earlier, I mentioned that we could just replace CMB detectors with spectrometers uh, to do intensity mapping. Uh, so a great candidate for this would be the South Pole Telescope, operated by UChicago. Uh, it's a 10-meter dish, has arc-minute angular resolution, uh, which is very well matched the scales we're interested in for the intensity mapping science. And uh, of course, it's uh, located in one of the best millimeter wave uh, sites on the planet. Uh, but SPT is busy doing its own science. Uh, the current receiver, SPT3G, is making uh, observations of the CMB for at least three more years. Uh, but that uh, doesn't mean we still can't use SPT. Uh, so here is a blow up of the, uh, the receiver cabin. So uh, you can see that uh, it mainly houses the large SPT3G receivers. So that's this large cylinder on the bottom, and there's some redirecting optics. Uh, but actually, the receiver cabin has some extra room uh, that can fit an additional instrument. Uh, actually, many folks here know that uh, because this space was used for uh, Event Horizon Telescope observations. So you can see in this diagram uh, how EHT placed uh, their, their VLBI receiver right here and installed a couple of mirrors to pick off the beam that comes from uh, the SPT primary and reflect it into the VLBI cryostat. Uh, so we started playing around with, with receiver designs to see if we could fit our own instrument in this space. Uh, and the answer is yes. So uh, last year, we put in a few proposals to deploy a, a Pathfinder instrument uh, that would demonstrate intensity mapping using on-chip spectrometers. Uh, and just a month ago, we heard that our project SPT Slim or the, uh, the, the SPT Summertime Line Intensity Mapper was funded uh, by Fermilab. So uh, this is really going to be a, uh, a hit and run demonstration. South Pole, tel uh, South Pole Station uh, is only open from November to February, so we need to build a small receiver, observe just during the austral summer season without removing the SPT uh, 3G receiver. Uh, and uh, so, so of course, we won't interrupt uh, normal, normal CMB observations. Uh, and we're, we're on track to deploy in, in about two years. And of course, we are uh, coordinating with Dan Maroney so we don't interfere with, with DHT also. Uh, this is a small Chicago-based effort, uh, just a handful of uh, UChicago Fermilab and Argonne scientists, uh, but we think we can do this. Uh, and as I said, the primary goal of, of SPT SLIM is to demonstrate uh, that intensity mapping can actually be done with these on-chip spectrometers. This is a, a necessary stepping stone towards larger arrays uh, with the sensitivity due to cosmology. And so we designed a focal plane that takes those individual super spec devices that I showed you earlier and squishes them all together uh, close in to improve uh, sensitivity uh, shown on the left here. Uh, so that's what the focal plane will look like. And we think this instrument is going to have similar instantaneous sensitivity to uh, contemporary experiments like time and CCAT prime. Uh, but of course, we're going to be demonstrating a new technology as well. Uh, and we anticipate that in a few weeks of observing at the pole, uh, we should be able to get a five second detection of the intensity mapping a signal of carbon monoxide uh, uh, between redshifts one and two. Uh, so this won't be the super high redshift signal that I was talking about earlier, but it will be enough to show that the instrument is, uh, is suitable for science and it'll tell us a lot about how these detectors work in the field. Uh, and we'll also actually learn something about the, uh, uh, the mean molecular gas content uh, at redshift one to two. So it'll do some science as well. Okay, uh, I will end here. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, millimeter, millimeter wave intensity mapping. I think it's an observable uh, that's gonna give us unique access uh, beyond, uh, beyond galaxy surveys. Uh, and there's a lot of cosmology and astrophysics to do at high redshift. Uh, but to do this, we need much more sensitive millimeter wave spectrometers. Uh, and uh, we are now demonstrating that with SuperSpec and uh, please stay tuned for uh, uh, results from SPT SLIM uh, and uh, our first intensity mapping demonstration in the next two years. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kirit. Um, really nice talk. And we have a few minutes left for questions. Um, so if the participants could please use the raise your hand feature, I can help uh, get us going for the Q&A. Great. I actually, I see a question from Max. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. Very nice talk. I was wondering, so you mentioned um, about, you know, the far infrared, like far infrared being a tracer of star formation being dependent on the dust, right? So I was mentioned, mm -hmm. I was wondering how, uh, 
you know, how, how true is this at very high redshift, right? Uh, do you, is that known how biased that is? And does it depend on the dust composition or mainly on the dust content? Thanks. Right, I, I think the short answer is we don't know. Uh, and the, uh, and of course, uh, especially very high redshift, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the models for, um, uh, for, for dust enrichment and, and uh, are, are, are sort of all over the place. And moreover, the observations are really only uh, of individual, uh, very, uh, very distinct objects and not, not the mean. So I think, uh, uh, I think the answer is we, we just have to, uh, have to make, do the observations and, and wait and see. We, we know, uh, we know that uh, these, these lines do exist at very high redshift, right? We know that C, C2 uh, exists out to redshift seven or eight. So uh, we're, not worried about, uh, we're not worried about being able to, to do these observations. Uh, the question is just what, uh, what, what does the mean signal level look like? Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for Curate? Um, okay. Well, I will ask an instrumentation focused question. Um, so, Curate, you have this timeline for two years for um, deployment of SPT SLIM of your Pathfinder instrument. Um, what, what, so what stage are you at now and wh what phases of the development and building of this receiver do you anticipate? Right. Uh, yeah, so the money just turned on uh, a few weeks ago. So we are now, uh, we're, we're still designing the cryostat. We have a basic, uh, uh, a basic model that should work, but there's a few tweaks that we need to do. So uh, we're, we're anticipating uh, getting, getting the major hardware ordered. And so we should have it in lab by the end of the year, we hope. Uh, and so that'll give us uh, about you know nine months uh, before we need to send it to the pole for the next season. Uh, that's that's for the cryostat, and then the detectors. We're uh, we are continually fabricating them uh, at, yeah, at U Chicago, but so far we've only made the the single devices. And so uh, in the next few months, we're going to start uh, making uh, you know several spectrometers on on a single on a single chip. So uh, we've we've allotted you know a year and a half for that development. Uh, because you know how these things go. Things so, happen, yeah. So yeah, we 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 hope to have a full device, a full uh, a full receiver in the lab uh, in maybe ten months from now. Okay. And so so you know six months of of, of testing before before sending the poll. I look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any last questions before we? end the seminar today. All right. Uh, well, so we are on the hour. On the hour. Um, thanks again to both of our speakers. And uh, we will see you next week. Bye. Thank you.